Ken Wilson. This uh, book is a labor of love. He'll tell you about it. That's why we're here. But uh, it's a wonderful book. I think uh, they have some copies there on the back table. Uh, Ken, let's. Uh, you, everyone knows you. I don't have to. It's not like you're uh, somebody that uh, we aren't familiar with. Up. But Ken Wilson from Dripping Springs, Texas, and his beautiful wife Debbie Wilson. Yay. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate y'all coming for this. Uh, this book has been a labor of love. Uh, a friend of mine who has published several books said don't expect to make any money, and you don't. But I had the best time selecting what I wanted to, to put in the book and then doing the research on it was so much fun. I just, uh, I'm so thankful to live in this age where we've got the internet and I can go anywhere in the world and read almost anything in the world and see almost anything in the world from my desk. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just, I really uh, appreciate, thanks to Club for having me. Debbie and I feel, we've, we've been here about 20 years, but some of you, uh, Lynette, have been here a lot longer for all the, the shows here in Wichita. Yeah, the very first year. And I still feel, we still feel like newcomers sometimes, and some of you know so much more about postcards than I do. And I've been grateful to learn from you. Uh, Jim Taylor's not here this morning, but I've learned a lot from Jim Taylor and a lot from Hal and so many others of you. I, I would take cards that I didn't know anything about. And it's just wonderful to go there. You have a whole room full of experts. So it was really, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you my little corner of the postcard collecting I started collecting postcards in the 1980s. Ned Coleman turned me on to the postcard club. Some of you know him. He's been up here a few times. And right away, I found that what I liked in postcards was history. I liked a, a view card, identified as to where it was. I liked real photos, but I liked them to be identified and I liked them to have a message and a postmark on the back. The more information I could get about that picture all went together. Uh, and so in this book, uh, I usually tell people, I've talked about this a couple of times, but Ken Burns, the uh, documentary filmmaker, uh, once said that he'd spent his entire life uh, trying to resurrect the small moments in history that sort of got lost in the larger sweep. Well, this is my own little version of his work. Uh, I couldn't begin to, to do what he did, but, I'm, but I like the, uh, that approach to history. On July the 31st, 1913, a very proud mom in Chicago sent this postcard snapshot photograph to her relatives in Iowa. And she told them, this is our bright little Indina boy. Now, we know that she meant Indian, but she spelled it Indina on the front and the back of the card. But even her misspellings and the child's costume and so forth tell us a lot about their life in Chicago. Uh, before anybody ever thought about cultural appropriation, this young kid is having a good time you know, as, a, as an Indian chief or an Indian warrior in his backyard. And it's very likely that his mother took the photograph, printed the photograph, tinted the photograph, and then wrote her message and sent it out. And uh, at the turn, as you know, at the turn of the 20th century, real photo postcards <laughs> like this just revolutionized communication across the country and across the world. Uh, for a moment, we'll cover old ground. I know, uh, and all during the talk, there'll be times when I'm telling you something, you go, oh yeah, I know. of course we know that, but some people in the room may not, so we'll sort of do an over, overview, just to set the stage. Uh, I mean, we all know that history, uh, postcards at the turn of the century just changed so much. There was so much already happening in the world. There was uh, new technology, uh, social mores were changing, immigrants were coming in, 
and suddenly these postcards fill the houses with interesting images, information, and the exchange just revolutionized communication. Here's the cover of the book. When I collected postcards, uh, as I said, I found myself really liking the ones that had messages. If I turn a postcard over and it's got a message on the back, like that, you know, it's like, I'm excited because I want to see what that says. If it tells me a lot about the photo, I'm real happy. If it just says, grandma's over the croup and uncle's leg is getting better, it's not so good. And, and we know most of the messages are very trite. But every once in a while, you get a message and a photo together that are just amazing and let you step back in history. One of the other things that were changing during that time, that, that photographs, uh, postcards documented everything. They documented all the changes, including social changes, uh, issues with public health, child labor, education, gender, and racial equality are all documented on postcards and postcard messages. Now, uh, forgive me if uh, you're real familiar with this. Some people are, but I, I gave this talk to our club in Austin, and some people collected other things and had no clue about the real photo, the production of real photo postcards. Um, just as the postcards begin to sweep the world, Kodak came out with a small portable camera. This is a Kodak 1A. They call this a pocket camera. It does fold flat to this, but you'd have to have a pretty good sized pocket. Now, I'm going to put it, uh, I'll put it over here and, and feel free to look at it. I'd rather not close it open because the bellow is getting old and worn. But uh, that is, this is the camera that really started the real photo postcard thing because the film for that camera is postcard size. And they supplied customers with postcard backs, <coughs> photosensitive postcard backs. And so it made it ready to go uh, for amateurs and professionals alike. Professionals went, oh, I don't have to carry that big box of a tripod. I can go take this and I can snap pictures of the Main Street and print them up and sell them at the drugstore or the depot. So if we look at this picture up here, what do you notice about the people in the picture? Somebody tell me so, anything about the people in the picture. Women. Mm -hmm. Women. They're all women. They're all female. Because the women, this, this was an art form that they could do. It was acceptable. It was like water coloring or flower arranging or something. It was something still ladylike. They could snap mm -hmm. pictures of their kids or their lives. And Kodak realized that, and they started marketing to women. That's who, the, the, the professional photographers were mostly male. Not all, but mostly. <clears throat> the amateur photographers were mostly female. And Kodak knew that. They marketed directly to women. You see the woman in the middle, upper middle there. She's, she has developed her own film. She's, she's taken a look at the film. Uh, they sold them kits for developing and printing, or they could take it to any photo uh, shop, dealer, photographer, and get them developed. Uh, oh, another thing about women. At just then, just as now, women were the communicators in the family. They were the ones that wrote the letters and wrote the postcards, so it all fit. <laughs> Okay, these are the first, that is just sort of a list of the parts and chapters of the book. Uh, part, part one is sort of what I've just gone over in a few minutes, only I stretched it out as far as I could. And <laughs> the second part there is the 20 chapters that I've developed, uh, that I've uh, put these postcards into. And as you know, a postcard can be sorted into at least three different so it was a hard choice sometimes. Okay, we'll get started. We're going to start with the first chapter is photog photographers and postcards. That postcard, the larger one there, well, both of those, uh, I borrowed from Ned Coleman. And I've seen that image before, but these are written and written by the photographer, Floyd Quick. 
opened his own studio in Indianapolis in 1905, but he soon sold the gallery and took his show on the road. And he writes to his father on the back of one of those cards, uh, Wabash, Indiana, I'm sorry, Wabash, Indiana, August 16th to 21, 1909. Sold my gallery, I'm on the road. See my outfit on the other side. Having a good time, good business. We'll be in Michigan in two weeks. We'll write you later. And he traveled, you know, uh, street fairs and carnivals and circuses. And he traveled, photographed all the people involved in those activities. And then he always set up and did, you know, get your picture done on a postcard in 10 minutes. They're still doing that today at state fairs and places. They give you a Western costume or something. And Debbie and I were real familiar with this. It makes sense to us because we made our living for more than 20 years setting up at art shows and selling art. And uh, so the whole thing of move in, set up, sell two days, pack up, move to the next one, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, we get it. It was hard work. He finally closed down doing this and he moved back to Detroit and he had a, photo, a photographic studio there for the rest of his life. Okay, I bought this online on eBay. I looked at it and went, that's a, when we're talking about the big black and white, we're, that's a professional photographer. You can just tell, look at him. But he didn't sign the card. He writes a note, but he didn't sign it. And I went, there's enough information there. He talks about where he's working and, and the information about who he mailed to. I, said, I knew I could figure it out. And it didn't take long to find it. it it's Aishel Curtis. It's Edward Curtis's brother. And he also was a very well-known West Coast photographer. He photographed the Klondike Gold Rush. He photographed uh, Alaska natives out whale hunting. And uh, so in some of those times, he sent those pictures back to his brother, and they were in business together. Unfortunately, he claims Edward marketed them under his own name, and the two brothers split and uh, remained apart, I think, the rest of their life. Uh, Aishel writes, Dear friend, I have a good job with Roman's Photo Company, commercial photographers here. Do a good deal of outside operating and strike a good deal of newspaper jobs. I intend to swing on to a paper with my photography and drawing together after a while. I'll remain, and then he just drew an arrow to himself. But this is, I'm sure you've all recognized that one. Very, very oh, well-known yeah. photograph. That's one of the photographs he did for Yellowstone. Now, Hal of Tal and Hal, Tal, Tal of Tal and Val, <laughs> Hal wasn't involved, uh, uh, tells me that the story is that that, that is him, that's Aishel, that he set the camera up here on a timer and went and posed for that. I always took it to be a ranger, but anyway, that's the story. Uh, and unfortunately, I've never seen any real photos of those Yellowstone cards like that, but, but they're still, I don't know, still very interesting. He was uh, quite the guy. When he, when he died, his family had his ashes put in a large urn, and they put it in the Snoqualmie National Forest on a big monument. And then here's the urn. Shortly thereafter, lightning struck the urn and exploded <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> And his family responded and they said, we're going to take that as a compliment to the man and his work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now this is uh, the work of an amateur photographer, uh, Earl, who spells his name I-R-L. Earl Dulban and Flora Horn were either friends or cousins, but she, had, she and her family had visited Earl and his family uh, in Kansas, but she lived in Pennsylvania. And she and Earl were both members of the International Photography Association at age, you know, 17, 18 years old. They both advertised in Camera Craft magazine and sold uh, uh, real photo postcards and supplies. And Earl writes to her after she's gone back to Pennsylvania. He writes, Cattle on the Plains. Thanks for the beautiful card. I think you do fine work. Come again. You're always welcome. IPA 2573 IH Dualbond, Kearney, Kansas. Uh, to me, I, I really like the background stories on these. And if you 
just thinking, I never could find out, well, I did find both of them in ancestry. They, they, they did not marry. They may have never met again. But this exchange was very interesting. And his work, he obviously climbed up on the windmill to take that picture of his father and his brother and their cattle. But one thing that I like is right there. See that? What is it? It's a pinhole. When Flora got this, she stuck it up on the wall for quite a while. So it's just a little touch, and some postcard collectors would just see that as a flaw, and I see it as a part of the story. Okay, a professional slide. Uh, this is Birdman Harry Atwood in Nyack, New York uh, in 1911. The Wright brothers first flew, as you know, in 1903, and after a few years, they began building and selling aircraft and giving instructions. Uh, Atwood took an hour and 55 minutes worth of instruction and bought his own airplane and took off. He set distance records, early long distance records, which in those days it wasn't, you know, we don't think of it today, but like uh, Boston to Washington, D.C. was a record. And when he got to D.C., he landed on the White House lawn, <laughs> and President Taft gave him a medal. Well, in this particular case, this photo, he was flying near Nyack, and his engine quit. He quickly found a place to land, that's it. And the people in the area, Nyack and surrounding areas, they heard this airplane struggling and they took off to go see where it landed. And they, some of the newspaper stories said the street, the roads were black with cars going out there. And this message was written by one of the people that showed up, said, we saw him land and leave the next day at Nyack. He went off like a bird. Suppose we will see plenty of them. This is a splendid picture of him just 10 minutes after he landed. I mean, look at that sentence. Suppose we will see plenty of them? I mean, that was amazing to him. And it's like, we look at that and go, uh, yeah. You know, it's like, whoa, I love it. And when I looked at that picture, I started to describe it in the book as he looked like he was standing up there, you know, majestically and looking into the future of aviation. He was looking downfield to see if there would be enough room to take off, and they had to chop down a widow's prized pear tree so he could take off. But he was quite the man in his day, set so many aviation records. Okay, we're going to come close. We're still flying, but we're close to home. Some of you have seen that. Bev, you said you have that car. Does anybody else have that car? Just Bev and I. Oh, and I meant to make fun of Bev. I forgot what I said. Bev always wears her Halloween sh sweater on the weekend, and she's not wearing it today, so it doesn't work. But I wore this orange and black this week. Thank you. I would wear something this afternoon. Okay. All right. Well, balloons, uh, you know, the balloons have a long history. They go back 2,000 years. But they were the used, like during the Civil War, they used them for observations. Scientists used them to go up and, and uh, test the atmosphere and the air and take photographs and so forth, but it didn't become a sport until after the turn of the 20th century. Then people were starting to get enough money they could afford to do this as a sport. And this is a national balloon race that started right here in Wichita at Wonderland Park which I think predated Joyland, right, Hell? Yes, it did. Yeah. It was a lot of a river, it was an island. Oh, okay. And uh, the message says, two of the balloons which were entered in the national balloon race, which started from Wichita recently, the one with the banner, won the race 330 miles. And I, I just think it's a great shot and a nice little piece of history. All right, moving on to something completely different. I had a reviewer uh, of the book who said these weren't the best real photos he had ever seen. And it's like, it wasn't the point of the book. The point of the book was telling history. This is a fairly ordinary, I mean, we, we'd look like that, and it, it's good, but, but what it tells us is about the beginnings of women moving into the workplace, the beginning of telephone systems coming to small towns, this town uh, first got the telephone in, I think, 1905 or something. 
uh, and here she is in 1911, and she writes to her friend, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year is the wish of your old friend. The reverse is the picture of me at the telephone office. It's taken without my glasses, so I don't look just right. <laughs> There's Rose, 40 years later, uh, well, maybe 40 years later. Anyway, her 40th wedding anniversary. That's Rose with her glasses. It's so wonderful what you can do on the internet nowadays. You, you can track anybody down. So, you know, mind your behavior, because somebody will know it. <laughs> All right, as more people could afford to travel, Star Lake, New York in the Adirondacks was a popular destination for people going out to get mountain air and going fishing and uh, buying Native American souvenirs. And uh, Jesse writes on the front of this card, this is a bunch I entertained one Sunday. The girls on each end are the girls I worked with in the shop, and I guess you know the one in the center. So it tells us, uh, you know, not only sort of we had this image, uh, but she later on in the message tells us that she'll soon be going home when the season's over. And this is seasonal work because just like the tourists, the people came and operated these businesses during tourist season. Uh, the rest of her message is very classic, uh, has nothing to do with that photograph, but I thought you might like it. Uh, well, I guess it does. She said, I thought I would drop you a line and let you know we're on Earth yet and expect to stay here until the last of October. Haven't seen you walking in yet. <coughs> expect to go to sewing soon. The dressmaker here is sick. Come up if you can. We can find enough to eat. Uh, and uh, she also included the last line of the message said, Take it any way you want. Herb's sister moved over to State Street and made $25 during the convention. <laughs> uh, in 1909, 46 people from Pennsylvania arrived in East Texas to begin new life in a new city, a new town. They had bought land sight unseen from a business, two businessmen in Chicago. The fictitious new town site was named New Chicago. Fred Birdsall sent his postcard home to Pennsylvania. The New Chicago investment was a fake. Out of 46 that came down, he has 21 left. Instead of farmland and the promised improvements for a town, they found only undeveloped, heavily wooded land without potential. A few stayed, but most went back, caught the train back to Chicago, and New Chicago faded into the woods of East Texas. There is no sign of it today. Uh, Art Roth was a railway express agent, and he decided he would start selling Indian motorcycles. Uh, he was in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. He, he took a horse race track, turned it into a motorcycle track, and he writes, Cousin I nails it all. How are you anyway? Busy as can be, I suppose. Everything is fine here, roads and weather. I sold 12 Indian motorcycles since last March, as ever art. Well, that sounds great, and I love the photo. And But his timing was off. This was 1915, and World War I had already started in Europe, and soon all of the Indian motorcycles went to France. 50,000 Indian motorcycles, the whole production of Indian motorcycles went to World War I, and the same was true for Harley Davidson and the British Douglas and the Triumph and all those motorcycles. So, you know, uh, uh, Art Roth may have gone back to the being an express agent, but it's an interesting piece of American history. Um, the object on that sled is a cheese, one cheese. This huge cheese on the sled was produced from curds, I'm reading from the card now, from 25 New York cheese factories. In 1915, it was shipped to San Francisco for the Pan Pacific Expo. It traveled for 17 days in a boxcar, and J.H. Searle rode the whole way in the boxcar with the cheese. When it got to the fair, they cut it up, sold it in one pound packages, or 25 cents, and they said fairgoers just scarfed it up and it was gone in a few days. 
Um, I'll read you. Let's see. I'm going to read you. the. Th this is another message that's, take this as the humor in the presentation. The message on the back. Now, the message on the front is about the cheese and the event. The message on the back says, Dear friend, I'm still here and more busy each day and night as aunt won't let strangers help. Mind failing, we will, we soon have, we will soon have help and she will not know. I am not feeling extra well, not used to so much confusion and hardships. I hear Jenny Gleason has a stroke and one of Alma's boys was wounded with a gun while cleaning it. If you know any particulars, let me know. I want to go home so much. <laughs> so, you know, that's just a good example of 100 years ago when people were sending their snapshot or photograph they bought and their message together, one thing, to somebody. We wouldn't see that again for 100 years and the advent of social media and suddenly people could text or you know all the various ways you can do that on the computer and send a little snapshot and a little note bang and it was just postcards were so ahead of that uh, this is a group of women campaigning for the right for women to vote Alma Lafferty is that woman right in the middle there kind of behind the hats and she writes on the back and names all of those women. You can see she's numbered them. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a two, and there's a three, and there's a six. Anyway, she names all the women. They were all prominent in the women's movement. And she had two uh, served in the uh, Colorado legislature for two sessions. Uh, not two sessions, but two. What am I trying to say? But anyway, anyway, she was really. And of course, women's the vote wasn't passed for until 1919, and not ratified until 1920. But in their messages and their publications about this, so, oh, by the way, they didn't go completely up in that balloon. It was a tethered balloon. They went up so high throughout leaflets. Uh, but they wanted to make sure at the time that those anti-women right people knew that they could cook. So it was balloons, vote for women's, and they were having suffrage donuts. Big deal on <laughs> suffrage donuts. So, uh, this is Bruce Rathburn. Uh, he obviously is a RFD carrier, and he writes to his friend, Hey, old pal, how's everything with you? Our roads are very bad at present. I lost two days before week before last with the grip. We have just two days slaying this winter. Farmers on my route have been plowing at different times every month this winter. And on the edge of the card he writes, this is my rig and the mayor I told you about in Omaha because he's writing to another postal delivery person. And uh, RFD was introduced uh, in uh, the late 1800s with a lot of support from people like Sears and Roebuck so they could get their catalog out and ship stuff through the mail to the people that lived out in the country. Now we see him and his uniform and his rig, it's all very nice. There's a personal touch of a young girl in the doorway who could be his daughter or it could be a young woman on the route that he ran. And, uh, I think it's his daughter and that's his home place and his wife sent the picture, but that's only my imagination. All right, this is something I was very happy to get this card. I knew, I didn't know anything about it when I got it, but I just thought, okay, that's pretty strange. What is that? It looks obviously like a snapshot. I mean, this kid, did, you know, he's going, what? What's happening? She is not very happy. That is Dr. Mary Walker. Y'all know her? Anybody? Okay, you will. Uh, she was a true American hero, but the rude caption on this postcard says, Dr. Mary Walker, the only self-made man in America. <laughs> she was a surgeon, she was a medical doctor, a surgeon, a feminist, and a suffragist. But she campaigned all her life for women 
to have the right to wear whatever clothing they wanted. She wasn't going to wear a tight corset. And she dressed most of her life in that, especially later on. Top hat, man suit, she did wear the spur stole all the time. During the Civil War, she volunteered to be a doctor on the battlefront. Lincoln and everybody else on down turned her down. Nope, can't go, you're a woman. Finally, uh, General Burnside allowed her to come and help as a volunteer. So she did nursing duties for a while and pretty soon they saw she could do anything and she was finally made a field surgeon. Uh, I was gonna read, in uh, uh, 1862, the New York Tribune reported, dressed in male habiliments, she carries herself amid the camp with a jaunty air of dignity well calculated to receive the sincere respect of the soldiers. She can amputate a limb with the skill of an old surgeon. She was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for her work during the Civil War. But in 1917, they rescinded any medals of honor that were awarded for anything other than combat. Hers was taken away. Buffalo Bills was taken away. And, she, and they were supposed to return them, and she said, the heck with that. And she wore it the rest of her life, and rightly so. so there's some, just some pictures off the internet of her in, her in her uniform. This is a uniform she figured out for herself on the field. So she's wearing a skirt, but she's still wearing trousers and so forth. There she is later on with her, her medal. There she is as a young woman when she was in medical school. And then that's the way she dressed most of her life. And she gave lectures <clears throat> about women's freedom to wear whatever they want and women's suffrage. And she, this photo was probably taken in 1912 when she uh, testified before a congressional committee. And she was on her way to that. And somebody obviously just snapped this. And I would imagine she hit him with that umbrella. <laughs> All right, and that's just more of her. She was from Oswego, New York. That's a statue of her that's there, and you can see there's several books about her. It's a very, very interesting life story. Um, this postcard tells why I did the book as much as anything. If you bought that postcard and nothing on it, it's like, okay, it's interesting. They're doing something out in the yard, out in the west there. They're in... Uh, 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 Austin, Colorado, uh, near the Gunnison River. This is a homestead there, and they're playing baseball on Sunday morning after church. Blanche writes, here's a game of ball with the Canyon Bloomers Easter Sunday in the Shoemaker's Yard. Do you recognize any of them? Art started this morning on his census work. It was 1910. He was, he was off to do the census. Got a card from Anna the other day, she said she was better. Got another from Lucy, she said she couldn't keep anything on her stomach, only buttermilk. Uh, how's everybody over there? We're all well. Baby is squalling to get out of doors. She is wearing Gertrude's shoes today. Couldn't get hers on this morning. I, I think the photo is wonderful. You can see the woman in black there has maybe just hit something and she's heading for second or however they've got the bases set up. Uh, those are fruit trees behind them. That area over there uh, near Delta and Montrose and so forth is, is fertile ground for fruit trees. They still grow a lot of fruit there today. All right. Norman Kinney writes, three kinds of foxes, four legs and two legs, 59 years young and eight years old. My chum, 33 days trapping at Eagle River, Wisconsin. Greetings of 1917, N.L. Kenny. In the back, he writes, Dear Anta, I am thinking of you today as of 50 years ago when you used to sing Old Shady to your little nephew. And then he signs it, Normie Kenny, on Bradford Hill. Norman Lafayette Kenny was born in Canada. He immigrated quickly to the United States, and he homesteaded in Eagle River, Wisconsin. He was the first farmer to break land in that county, and he grew potatoes, 
buckwheat, and corn. He was a fur trapper and he sold furs and butchered livestock and he sold meat to uh, the fur companies and the locals in Eagles River. And there's just so much detail in some of these. Uh, the rifle is a Winchester 73. Uh, the freedom, the song that he said his aunt sung to him, Old Shady, that was a freedom song sung by slaves and escaped slaves in the North uh, <clears throat> living under the protection of the Union Army. Pat. Do I have that name right? Pat, right? Pam. Pam. Sorry. That's close. Okay. Uh, this is the one I told you about that I said was just for you and I wouldn't tell you the whole story. Okay. Jacob. Jacob was born in Austria he, into a family of bakers. They taught him the baking trade. Right away as a, as a teenager, he moved to Switzerland by himself got jobs as a baker in big hotels in Switzerland. He wasn't through moving yet, and he soon caught a boat to New York as an immigrant, got jobs at the Waldorf Astoria and other big New York places as a baker, and he kept moving across the country. And in, uh, where's my year? In 1909, he was in Seattle. And this was taken a few years later, it's right at 1915, the card has a cancel for the World's Fair in San Francisco. And his message is written in German to, his, to friends he met in Boston who were also bakers. And he says, part of his message says, that is how a good hunter needs to be equipped. You should see me when we set off in a few weeks. Best greetings to your wife and two little ones, Obexer J. He uh, right away started using the name Jake instead of Jacob. And in San Francisco, he worked at the Fairmont Hotel, the Palace Hotel, the uh, St. Francis Hotel, as a baker. And he notices the trout they're serving in the kitchens and in the restaurant part of the hotel. And he, where did this beautiful trout come from? They said, well, Lake Tahoe. He had to catch a train zipped up to Lake Tahoe, and he said as soon as he saw Lake Tahoe and the mountains, he said, this is where I'm going to anchor for the rest of my life. So for several years, he would go back and forth. In the winters, he'd be down in the hotels. In the summers, he's on Lake Tahoe, and he buys himself a skiff, and he runs errands back and forth across the lake, he delivers groceries, he fixes motors, he fixes boats, Pretty soon he's selling boats uh, and uh, just, you know, living the life of Raleigh. He loves it there and he fits right in. This is Obexer's today. His grand great-grandchildren run this monstrous boating. You can get everything there. Groceries, fix your boat, rent a boat, anything. And, and that's the way it is today. Um, I, I hope, I know the fires didn't get to that. So, you know, hopefully that's still there. But he set up a whole life there uh, and, uh, you know, just young immigrant, Jacob to Jake. I, I, I think it's a great story. All right. Uh, this is the Merrimack River and uh, Haverhill. Haverhill. Haverhill? Haverhill. I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> Don't, somebody tell me what it is. Haverhill. Haverhill. Is that right? Haverhill? Okay. I'm from Texas. I haven't been anywhere. Haverhill. <laughs> Haverhill, Massachusetts. Anyway, it is on the Merrimack. Did I get that right? Merrimack. Yes. Okay. And the businesses there use the water power from the river there to power a lot of things. And this town became a shoe manufacturing town. Lots of shoe businesses there. They had a railroad bridge across the river. But it was right down here, so that when you came up onto the land on either side, there's grade crossings for the automobiles and so forth. It was quite a hassle. So they decided to raise the bridge. That's the original bridge. They jacked it up 13 feet, put stone pillars under it, jacked the whole bridge up. They built this as a temporary so the trains could keep running and redid that whole bridge. And then when they opened the bridge, 
That's the first train to cross the bridge. It looks like all the men came out with their derbies and the women were, I don't know, they, maybe they didn't let them come. Uh, and uh, the message on that one says, first train, February 4th, 1906, Haverhill, Mass. Every ticket to Ward Hill was sold. Every seat, every inch of standing room to the lowest step was occupied. Depot and platform crowded. And you can, there's all sorts of newspaper stories about them doing that and rebuilding the crossings to the cars and uh, leaving uh, on the embankment for the, for the train after they got on land, they left big arches in it so that the western stun could still come through there and catch the businesses that were on the other side. It's, I don't know, it was a great story. Uh, and then we're close to home again. This is Mulvane. Did I get that right? Or is it Mulvane? Mulvane. Mulvane. Right down here across, across the road from y'all's casino. I know, I know you all know where the casino is. Uh, Emma Schaefer was 21 years old uh, and living with her mother in Mulvane. And she sent this postcard uh, to a friend. And that is a picture of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad ambulance. Uh, great picture, great image, and of course automobiles were just starting to come in and take over from this sort of equipment. So it, it's a, a real classic for its time. Uh, one of the things about that hospital is that Santa Fe Railroad developed their own system of hospitals and medical care for their employees because there were so many terrible railroad accidents way out away from cities, so they needed care for them. And they learned to care for these real traumatic injuries from the doctors who had learned during the Civil War. And those, everything they learned and so forth went on to, uh, to become the basics of medical care for traumatic injuries in World War One and before that, so mm -hmm. they were uh, they were breaking ground, and they also it was new for a company to provide such care for their own employees. It was their first medical system for for employees. Uh, of course, uh, people of color had to have their own separate wing; they could not be treated together. Um. I'll screw up this name too because I had a hard time with this one. Uh, Lake Hupatcon. Hupatcon? Is that right? Somebody corrected me on that earlier. But anyway, in New Jersey, Lake Hupatcon. 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 Okay. It was a resort, kind of like the one we, we saw earlier in New York. Uh, and this was a resort for New Yorkers, and in the winter uh, they would come there and ice skate and so forth. In the summer they would fish and, and uh, have boats out there on the river and so forth. But also at the end of the river, at the end of the winter, as uh, the skating and so forth was over, people were going back, they harvested the ice. It was quite thick. They saw the ice, they stored it in giant warehouses. There were five big warehouses around the uh, shore of the lake there, and one Saturday night, they were having parties and all everything was going on, and five of these warehouses burned to the ground. Uh, they were sword stacked in hay, and so were wooden warehouses, and they left this amazingly visual uh, scene of all of this ice sitting there stacked up and melting. Uh, Dad writes, uh, I wish I had my... Dreadful cold up here. I wish I had my winter underwear. That was some postcard I found here. Glad I did not get it until I returned home for I'd have been worried about my money. But this is the Knickerbocker Storm. Uh, this is in Washington, D.C. And uh, it was a new, inno new innovation for architecture. It was a big flat roof on top of this uh, theater. That's the way the theater looked in its heyday. And during the winter, a big blizzard theater was full of people watching a silent movie and the roof caved in. The roof, the snow, the ice, the balcony, everything came down on the people that were in there. 
and they said it was just a death pit. 98 people died. Uh, hundreds were tra trapped for hours and hours. You know, during the night, it's still wet and cold. Uh, two young boys uh, survived because they crawled under their seats. Uh, one young girl survived because two women, two women cushioned her, but they both died. Uh, one young boy, uh, after the sun came up, he was crawling through the wreckage, taking water to people that were still trapped. It was quite the event, uh, just a terrible tragedy. Uh, and Emma writes, Dear Mom, this is a view of the disaster. Don't worry, I never go to that kind of music in all that uh, music. I never go to that kind of movie in all that snow. The places I go are like where I took you, never in that section of the city. Well, that section is almost next door to the White House. But <laughs> uh, She said, no need to telegraph. They will telegraph you if anything happened to me. <laughs> okay, and this we'll do this one shortly too, but the message on this says, this is where the grasshopper oil field started. And in Warren, PA, somebody found a pool of oil that was only about 25 feet under the ground. All of the neighbors started pounding pipe into the ground. Oil was coming up. They put kitchen pumps. That's what he's got, a kitchen water pump. And, and they're pumping oil and filling barrels and selling them. They're, we're going to be rich, and we're going to be rich. And it turns out it was a, either an oil spill from nearby oil wells, or it was just a freak pool. But it was soon pumped dry, and uh, their dreams of wealth were, were dried up also. But I like him. He's standing up there and going, this is, this is his well nip and tuck number two. <laughs> All right, now this is a loner card from Hal. Uh, it, it's, I think it's an amazing card. As we reach the end of the golden age of postcards, World War II was happening, and that was one of the factors that brought the postcard use, changed it dramatically anyway. And this was a quilt that uh, a woman in uh, Nebraska, Sydney, Nebraska, she quilted this and she got volunteers to do a square for the quilt and stitch their names into it. And then she pieced it all together. And I'm assuming that in this black and white photograph that these are all red. I mean, that would have been such an amazing quilt. And she said they raised... Uh, 72. Yeah, 72, yeah, on, on contributions and so forth. And then the, the quilt sold for $45, which in 1918, before people were really collecting quilts, that, that wasn't too bad. But I like that. And uh, the Red Cross was such a big thing, deal then. Uh, President Ro Ex-President Roosevelt really campaigned hard for the Red Cross and really praised them as being second only to the Army. And all of his family were, were Red Cross volunteers. Uh, anyway, when I saw that card, I, I told Hal I just had to, had to have at least a copy of it. All right, we're going to finish up with this one, which is, I think, a sweet little card. That's, you see all sorts of uh, paper moon cards, but She's standing up there and she says, I'm from Glenwood, Missouri. Her mother writes, I did not know her papa was going to take this. Thelma combed her hair herself. It's a new moon he just had made, and they was just trying to. He hasn't made the stars yet, though. <laughs> so I think it's neat. Uh, I would say maybe he wasn't a professional photographer. You know, I don't know. It's not the best moon thing I ever saw. Uh, and maybe he's getting ready for a local carnival, or maybe he does go out on the street and take paper moon pictures. I don't know, but I just love the way the whole thing looks, and it gives us a you know a peek behind the scenes and that sort of thing. So I, I like to finish up with her, uh, and um, let's see. Okay, so here's the book. Picture my dad took. And there's my thanks to you.
wipe shit. Uh, here's, this is a special just for you guys. And uh, I'm not going to talk during it, which you'll enjoy. <laughs> there you are. That was uh, 2009 and our own paper moon, which uh, Debbie and Brian Jones did a lot of work on that. And I've forgotten who made the moon, Hal. Was it Chris? No. Um, Somebody local. It was family. Yeah. My family. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, for those of you, if you missed that, that was a heck of a yeah, fun thing. Fun. There's Brian again. Oh, there's there. Terry. Tyler Jim and Wally. <laughs> uh, Jim Mayer. And I like, I think Ulrich really did, took the best advantage of it to get his camera out and everything. Yeah. He's the one that collects he photographers' looks, studios and things like that. He looks so young there. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> the Petersons. There's the Petersons. The Petersons. Tom Mulvaney. Tom Mulvaney. Yeah. Jim and his wife. Yeah. Susie. Yeah. So how, when were these taken? Oh, there's, there's 1909. I mean, 2009. 2009. 2009. 2009. And Obie is wearing his wonderful hotel robe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's the Petersons yeah. from yeah. Texas. Uh, and that's uh, Ron Simpson. He's, from he's also he Austin started Texas. the Austin Club. And uh, he's, he's been gone now a while, but I, I like that picture of him. Yeah, it looks like he's taking a nap. Yeah, <laughs> he was a sweet guy. That's Pretty what that sweet. Wow, oh, Dolores and Leon. Yeah. And oh, Nick and his wife. Yeah. 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 Lynn. Oh, Shirley and uh, Bill. Bill Martin. Bill Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, good, wow. good. All right, and we're almost there. Ta da! Oh. <laughs> If I do a second book, I'll be too old to stand up. <laughs> we'll get you a chair. They're spreading manure on the Kansas street. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Remember that car? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I have, you know how to, I mean, I have, uh, I think there were 170 or so images in this book, and I have twice that many more that I would have liked. Oh, yeah. Do. You know how it goes. Thank you all for coming. It's been Thank great. You for coming, yeah.